Greetings, fellow travelers on the interwebs. Welcome back to another episode of ATP, Ask the Pastor. I am Pastor Joshua Sullivan at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. Dear Pastor, how does one deal with the phrase, that's not in the Bible? I fully understand that everything that is necessary for salvation is in Holy Scripture. Yet I have seen and heard multiple claims from my evangelical brothers and sisters in Christ, Baptist and non-denominational, that making the sign of the cross, for example, is a form of idolatry and that it's breaking the second commandment. Thus I am condemning myself to hell. Another example of this phrase being used is with the image of our Lord on the cross, which is centered behind the altar at our parish. In short, we need to take him off the cross as he is not there anymore, and it is considered idolatrous to keep him on said cross. Lastly, just the way as we Anglicans worship, just liturgy, liturgical worship in general, is attacked as well with the phrase, that's not in the Bible. Now, I don't come across these claims much. However, I have come across them enough to be frustrated and confused as to how to answer. Any help from you would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, hey, <laughs> we've all been there. Uh, when people make the accusation, uh, this accusation, what it signals is a misunderstanding of the commandment against graven images. It also signals a rejection of adiaphora, that is, things which are neither commanded nor forbidden in the scripture. So let's take a look at the commandment first. The commandment against graven images, which for Lutherans is part of uh, the first commandment, and it's the second commandment for Baptists, this commandment does not condemn all images. It condemns worshiping and venerating images. So if we go further into the law, Leviticus 26, verse 1, the Lord says, You shall not make idols for yourselves. Neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it. God is strictly forbidding images as objects of worship. If the commandment forbade all images, then the Lord himself violated his commandments on multiple occasions in the book of Moses in the books of Moses. So for instance, Exodus 25 verses 18 and 19, the Lord commands Moses to make two cherubim of gold and to place one on each side of the mercy seat. That's the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Those are graven images in specifically the likeness of things in heaven above in the words of Exodus 20 verse 4. In the next chapter in Exodus 26, the Lord commands the curtains, uh, which were walls of the tabernacle, uh, to have images of cherubim on them as well. If you go to Numbers chapter 21, the Lord commanded Moses to fashion a serpent of bronze, put it on a pole, and erect it so that all Israelites who were afflicted with these fiery serpent bites could look to it in faith and be saved. You know, that bronze serpent would qualify as an image of something in the earth beneath. Again, Exodus 20, verse 4. These examples show us that the commandment isn't an absolute prohibition of images. It's a prohibition of worshiping and venerating images. If we look later on in the Old Testament, in the, tab uh, in the tabernacle, but also in the temple, images of the cherubim, again, are used to decorate the place. Uh, and again, they are to call, they're not to be worshiped, but rather they call to mind God's holiness. And they remind the worshipers there that God was truly present in the temple. The image of the bronze serpent was also retained in the temple until the days of the king Hezekiah. Uh, it served as a, a memorial and a reminder of God's gracious salvation in times past. Hezekiah only destroyed it during his days because people were foolishly worshiping it, which actually is a violation of the commandment. The crucifixes are the same way. Uh, the, the purpose of them is not to be an object of worship. We don't worship the crucifix. It's a memorial. It's a reminder of the chief act of God's mercy towards us poor sinners. It's an image of our redemption by the innocent, bitter sufferings and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds us of the severity of our sins by showing us their punishment. But it also, and more importantly, calls to our mind the love of God in sending his only begotten son into human flesh uh, to die for our sins and, and to earn, make full atonement for them and earn forgiveness for every sin. When people rail against the crucifix uh, based on the commandment, all they're doing is showing that they're ignorant of the commandment. Now, the other reason uh, that our viewer hit, and our viewer hits on this is that people just don't want to have Jesus on the cross. Uh, and so they want to take him down from there. 
Uh, when people say that we should take Jesus down from the cross, what they're really showing us is that they don't want to be reminded of their sins and they don't want to be reminded of the chief work of Christ. Lots of folks, uh, your friends and some of mine included, uh, imagine that an empty cross signifies that Christ is no longer hanging there, that he's risen. But the truth is, the empty cross, uh, even from the earliest Christian usage, has always signified the sufferings and death of Christ. It's an instrument of death for crying out loud. How is that a symbol of the resurrection? What this shows us, or what this shows us, that is that people would rather focus upon the resurrection and the glory of Christ at the expense of his suffering and death to atone for our sins. People in every age want to focus on the victorious and the glorious. And while it's true that Christ is risen from the grave, Paul explicitly tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2 that he determined to speak of nothing to them except for Christ and him crucified. Now, that includes the resurrection, and he makes that clear in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, but Christ's death is still the central focal point. The resurrection isn't even an event that exists separately from the death of Christ because the resurrection of Christ demonstrates that God the Father accepted his sacrifice for the sins of the world on the cross. When people say, well, you just need to take Jesus down from the cross, what they are doing is they're taking down the focal point of Christianity. The focus has never been solely upon the empty tomb, nor can it be, since the empty tomb is a testimony about Christ's suffering and death. Yet, people in every age want to avoid Christ crucified because, as Paul said, it's a stumbling block and it's foolishness to the sinful nature. The sinful nature, frankly, is attracted to glory and it's adverse to any kind of suffering even the sufferings of the Son of God upon the cross. The sign of the Holy Cross, make, making the sign of the cross upon oneself, functions in a similar way. Uh, it's also a, rem a memorial, a reminder that Christ died for our sins. It's a reminder also that we have been baptized into Christ, into, the, uh, into his death, since at holy baptism we received the sign of the Holy Cross both upon our foreheads and upon our hearts. Making the sign of the cross on oneself is also a very ancient practice. Basil of Caesarea mentions it in Book 27, uh, chapter, six, uh, chapter 66, uh, of his work on the Holy Spirit. You know, already at the time of Basil, probably writing in the 370s, crossing oneself had become uh, had long been a long-standing tradition in the church. Uh, it's also something that Luther teaches us to do every evening and morning before our prayers, um, as we uh, say the invocation uh, in the small catechism. So using crucifixes uh, and using the sign of the cross, the important thing to remember with these is that they're ceremony. Uh, they're ceremonial, which Christians can use every day to root their faith and their piety in Christ crucified for them. Now, when someone claims then that these ceremonies are sinful, uh, what they're doing is they're condemning things that God has not condemned. With adiaphora, with things that are neither commanded nor forbidden, God wants, or rather, excuse me, God grants us freedom to use them as long as they don't become idolatrous. Uh, now, when someone condemns these images as sinful, they're taking away Christian freedom to use these things. Uh, there are a lot of things that are adiaphora in the church, and the church and the individual Christian can employ them uh, to teach the scriptural faith and to inculcate a piety that daily looks to Christ in repentance for one's sins and trust in his atoning death. Since crucifixes and the sign of the cross are adiaphora, you can use them or you could not use them. But when they're attacked and reviled as sinful or as papist, then we should utilize them all the more, uh, not just to confess Christ crucified as the focal point of our faith, but to confess our Christian freedom and maintain that Christ-centered piety of St. Paul and the Apostles. You know, here's the thing about uh, that's not in the Bible, that rant is it goes both ways. You can use that on your Baptist and non-Denom friends as well. For instance, baby dedications aren't in the Bible. You know, Hannah's dedication of Samuel in the temple is not the same thing as what Baptists do today. They dedicate the child to the Lord and promise to raise that child in the Christian faith. Hannah actually gave her son to be a ward of the temple. You know, Even more so, both groups should be asked um, why they teach doctrine that's not in the Bible. And so that door swings both ways. There's a big difference between teaching and holding doctrines that aren't in the Bible, like Baptists and non-denominationals do, and using adiaphora that uphold the Scripture's teachings. And as for liturgical worship, you mentioned that too. Uh, that can be found uh, in our video entitled, Is the Liturgy Adiaphora? So make sure and check that one out. The bottom line is, keep your crucifix. 
and let it always remind you of what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. Make the sign of the Holy Cross upon yourself as a daily reminder that you are baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ and so that your sins are forgiven and you should walk in the newness of life. Christ has given you the freedom uh, to do these things. Uh, Don't let anybody take that freedom from you and enslave you with their legalism. Thanks for the question. We'll see you next time on ATP.